to Good Game. I'm Hex. And I'm Bajo. This week on the show, we've got you covered if you happen to like fabulous hair or urban planning, starting with city skylines. I like both those things. If only you could combine them together. <gasps> hair Planner 2000. And we're on the run with a group of hairspray enthusiasts in Final Fantasy XV. <sighs> Sometimes I wonder if we'll ever sit inside that beautiful car again. Plus, Goose takes a look at why there's such a lack of women working in the games industry. 8.7% women in the Australian games industry is not good enough. It's less than mining. But before all that, can you name the game for this week? Here's what's making headlines. New research has found the presence of a digital nose in VR demos can reduce feelings of nausea in subjects. Assistant Professor David Whittinghall at Purdue College of Technology in Indiana tested how nausea levels were influenced by the addition of a digital nose in various VR demos. Subjects who saw the nose were able to play for longer periods without nausea than those who played the normal demos. Are you actually going to vomit? I think I'm okay. Russia will be the only country to receive a new free-to-play version of Halo built for PC. Halo Online is an entirely multiplayer-focused game developed by Sabre Interactive using a modified version of the Halo 3 engine to make it compatible with a large number of PCs. Publishers are increasingly using different markets to trial launches like this, with Activision recently releasing an open beta of Call of Duty Online in China only. And in some speedrunning news, Fallout 3's normally lengthy campaign has been beaten in a mere 18 minutes and 53 seconds, earning player Rideout a new world record. The new time was achieved by taking advantage of known exploits, such as a bug that allows players to pass through walls for a few seconds after saving the game. The record shaves four seconds off the previous record of 1857, also set by Rideout. And that's all for this week. Thanks, Goose. I think it's safe to say that Final Fantasy XV has been a long time coming. Yeah, and then some. It was first announced as Final Fantasy Versus XIII. That was way, way back in 2006. In the nine years since then, it skipped an entire console generation and has since changed names to become Final Fantasy XV. Yes, that's quite a long production cycle. We're talking Duke Nukem Forever territory <laughs> here. And it's still not finished, but at least they've released a demo, which they've called Episode Duske. some real chemistry here. That's what I call teamwork. I don't know about you, but I've always found Final Fantasy pretty eclectic. I mean, it's like there's this giant blender and they're just throwing ideas in. Here's some magic, some high-tech vehicles, a lot of big monsters, a bit of sword combat, and some seriously over-the-top fashion. Might already be a lost cause. I mean, sure, it looks beautiful, but it's a real mishmash of a fantasy world. And yet the games always have similar ideas and themes. This time there's a backdrop of nations at war over some magical crystals. And you play Noctis, a prince on the run. <coughs> but I can't say much of that came through in this demo. It opens up with you and your buddies waking up in a tent really slowly. Rise and shine, princess. And then they start talking about how they need to get their car fixed. We hawk whatever we hunt till we come up with the cash, then fetch the car. Hex, these guys don't look like war heroes to me. They look more like they're from an 80s goth band. And why do they even need a car? The game shows us they can teleport. Drive teleport? I know what I'd pick. <laughs> well, I don't think we should worry about the plot too much at this point. With a game as epic as Final Fantasy, I think it's always hard to carve out a demo and have it make much sense. Fair enough. They do have fabulous hair, though. Aren't we lucky? Well, something I do think that makes a lot of sense is the switch to an open world. The days of being funneled down a narrow path and stumbling into random encounters are well and truly gone. A bit like Final Fantasy XII, you can spot enemies off in the distance and make up your own mind about whether you want to fight them or just run away. Is uh, anybody else feeling a little out of their league? Just don't let your guard down. Enemies also have an awareness meter that's shown as a red bar. In theory, you've got until the bar fills to decide whether or not to engage. 
But that only really worked for me when I already knew where the enemies were. Anytime I had to stop and look around for the enemies, the fight would begin by the time I'd found them. I'm going all out. Tight. I noticed that too. I think some sort of on-screen minimap could have helped with that disorientation. But on balance, I prefer having a minimal HUD. Stay sharp. This game also makes the move to a completely real-time combat system. While it is a shame to lose some of that semi-turn-based strategy, I think full-blown real-time combat works for a world like this. Yeah, I tend to agree. I think it just makes for a refreshing change for a Final Fantasy game to do this. And I liked how you can cover distance quickly with warp attacks and then carve away with those flashy sword strikes. I think there's a bit too much spamming of the attack button, but I do like some of the details they put in. Timing comes into play with the counters, and I like the heavy attacks that put enemies off balance and make them more vulnerable. <laughs> It feels good to be back at work. Yeah. And what about that summon hex? Wow, yes. I mean, Final Fantasy summons have always been something special, but this was just like a whole other level. <laughs> Walking around the charred aftermath, I almost felt sorry for the enemies I'd used it on. Oh, poor doggies. It's glorious overkill, isn't it? I hope they're all as epic as this. Yeah, absolutely. Just knowing they're going to make real use of that new console hardware to sweep us up in those spells, it just it has me genuinely excited. I think it's safe to say that a few years ago, Final Fantasy as a series was in trouble. 13 was quite underwhelming, and the first MMO release of 14, it was just broken. Square Enix did go back to the drawing board, however, and rebuilt 14 into quite a good MMO. And now it seems like they're embracing loads of new ideas in 15. <laughs> I'm just so happy to be excited about Final Fantasy again, and I'm keen to see how this plays out. Yes, well, hopefully, it's worth the wait. We need only concern ourselves with one thing and one thing alone. The money. Hi. I'm Dave Cowan, games investigator, and I'm just doing some filing because I'm in the 70s. You know, I've known a lot of two-bit felons on these streets, but the most annoying character of all time would have to be that no-good Gungan, Jar Jar Binks. Opa Gungan style. So perhaps it should come as no surprise that Jar Jar can be found, presumed dead, in Star Wars, The Force Unleashed. If you look closely in the trophy room on the Imperial Kashyyyk level, you'll find the gangly Gungan silenced for all eternity in a cold carbonite slab. Look, he's not even moving, and he's still annoying. Maybe The Force Awakens refers to Jar Jar returning from his eternal slumber. Maybe J.J. Abrams stands for Jar Jar Abrams. Whew, enough nightmares for now. Hello, Callum G.I. A poisoning? I'll be right there. I love a good poisoning. Female representation and sexism in video games have been heated discussion topics in the industry for a long time. But now, more than ever, women are giving a voice to what they want from their games and the types of games they want to play. And although there has been a big shift in the numbers of women consuming games, the percentage of women working as developers in the industry is still an incredibly sobering statistic. The most recent ABS survey discovered that only 8.7% of Australian games developers are women. And while globally these stats are marginally higher, hovering around 20%, compared to the number of women working in similar creative professions, the video game industry is way behind on the gender balance. It's got a lot to do with our beginnings as a tech industry and how the tech industry became really coded masculine and then it sort of fed through to game development. Can you, if you put in that magnetic card, then can you put in any height that you want? And yeah, the program will accept any height. Now, we put in the same ones that we used on the plotter over here. Women in coding was uh, and computer development were huge to begin with. Um, even the term debug was coined by a woman who literally had to climb into one of the earlier PCs and pull the bugs out of the, um, uh, the system. So women have been very tightly interlaced with programming. 
I like my glossy black. It was only when home PC started to being marketed to boys and that we saw a drop off. And then later in the 90s, around about the time first person shooters started coming out and video games got bloody and violent, very male orientated. Again, we saw another drop off. But women have always been there, a very key and important part. A lot of it's a part of a broader story as well, um, where there's not enough um, women participating in STEM, so science, tech, engineering, mathematics. People decide very young on whether or not this is their skills. In the UK, but by the time um, a, a young woman is in is in year eight, she, there, it's most likely that she will have been put off technology by a parent or a peer uh, or a teacher. It's really depressing to see the imbalance, not just of enrolments, but of graduates. Um, we start with better numbers. We start with, m well, not m even, but we start with more women and we graduate fewer. Once something's got a, it's a vast majority of men and then everyone knows that, then that can be very intimidating and sort of act as a barrier. In a world that's full of belief, a changing attitude. Women aren't going to feel comfortable in a, in a place where men not only dominate the workforce, but dominate the language, the landscape, and the culture. Super Nintendo Entertainment System. And really that started mainly because of that, how games were initially sold and how, where video games came from. You know what Elliot's gonna do? Jeff too. And who they were most played by, and those were young men. Three, it hooks up to his TV. And Jeff's at his Radio Shack Color Computer 3 playing the newest football game. And when those young men grew up, they became programmers that made games that young men want to play. Well, I, I only play for the fighting. And that kind of self-perpetuation of that whole cycle has led to build an environment that's not very friendly to women. It's definitely a, a sort of a risk to take in some ways to, to go, yes, I'm a woman and I'm a gamer. And there's often a reaction. Growing up as a girl gamer, um, the discouraging thing was just the lack of female characters. Uh, it wasn't a problem for me so much because at the start we had games like Gauntlet where you had the, you know, the red Valkyrie. But uh, when we went into the 90s, all of a sudden the female characters dried up. Who is a gamer um, is still, it's so important to that kind of core group that if you're a girl, you're probably not a gamer in the first place because you don't tick all of these other boxes. Um, that we've made up on the spot. You know, you didn't have a Commodore 64, or you don't have a favorite Pokemon, or whatever the criteria is. There are a lot of challenges I think that women face as a consequence of the gaming culture and the consequence of the coding culture. Um, if men have a hard time accepting that women are outperforming them in something, they will ensure that the women don't have the opportunity to compete in that venue. And that's what you essentially see happening in Gamergate, for example. By now not allowing women to compete, you won't end up losing to them. Um, it's, as a consequence, it's harder for women to get into the culture because the culture is unfriendly. That it's not all the individuals that, of course, are being unfriendly. It's the ones that have the most to lose. 8.7% women in the Australian games industry is not good enough. It's less than mining. That's, yeah, that's ridiculous. So we, we really need to have main peak industry bodies standing up and saying, yeah, we've got to do something better about this because this is not, not good enough. And when I started to look into the stats and to various different things, and I, I was trying to figure out, like, how do I help these numbers improve? Because at one point I had thought that the that the numbers would have just improved over time naturally, but I was starting to, but I have realised that actually that's not the case. We need to do a lot more and be a lot more active and vocal. And some of the things that I have um, put my attention into would be getting involved with education. I was offered a scholarship um, as, as a woman coming into programming, and that's why I took it. So that, I mean, that needs to continue. Definitely just kind of showing girls that this is an option and, and this is something that could happen. You need to be seeing people doing what you're doing or people doing what you want to do and aspire to that you can relate to. So if you're only seeing white men doing this thing that you want to do and you're a black woman, you, it's much harder for you to go, I can see myself in that position. Um, so I'm really keen on getting more women to stand up and say, hey, this is what I do. And, and that way younger people can then identify with that 
and, and be able to go, yeah, I could do that too. Elements of yourself, I think, do come into it. Being more visible myself has been a thing that I have also had to um, get the courage to do. Um, and uh, as much as I'm very, I mean, I'm always very happy to be asked to do things, I always have like a lot of nerves about doing them. And I've, I've realized it's actually useful for people to know that, and to, but also to see that there are people like them making games and being visible within the games industry. I like working for Sierra because I founded it. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm probably one of the few game designers that have that, that character be female, you know, quite often. And I think in order to support women to stay around, we need to really have invest efforts in women specifically. A lot of companies are indies now because of that GFC thing, so a lot of indie companies don't have an HR department. They don't have somewhere you can contact and who will fight for you or bring up grievances that you have. If you look at the pay gap differences, uh, we're looking at a $10,000 pay difference, Australian dollars, uh, between men and women, and then another 10,000 between programmers and artists. So if you're a female artist like myself, you're $20,000 less than a male programmer. However, some people have spun this wage gap into a positive. Earlier this year, for instance, Giselle Rosman launched an incentive for Game Jam Melbourne in the hopes that more women would participate. I developed what we call the um, wage gap discount. So it's generally recognised that in Australia, um, women get paid 17% less than men, so all women got a 17% discount. I then had someone go, I understand why you're doing that, because we don't have enough women involved, and can that, if this is going to help get more women involved, great. I've just bought three tickets, can you give them to some women who'd like to come along? And then that snowballed, and we had 25% women jamming in Melbourne out of 200 jammers which may not sound great, but having been involved in events for so long, I can tell you that the average is between 5 and 15%. For someone with such a fondness for women, I wonder if you've ever considered what it might be like to be one. You can't just wait, because if you just wait, nothing changes. Um, there have to be um, people, and, and generally I do mean men, who will stand up and say, look, I, I'm a feminist, or I have uh, an interest in, in women's rights. She wants to go out and work, have a career other than being a mom, that she should be able to do that as well, and that that's to the benefit of everybody. Or, I want to see more women in my office, I'm going to do something about it. I'm going to go and uh, help younger girls learn how to program computers, or I'm going to sit and listen to somebody tell me about their game ideas, or um, something positive, you know, that, that it's a, again, that um, I'm not going to... I'm not going to harass a woman. Well, congratulations, you're a functional human being. So, are we equals? Being selective and filling your panels with three women and two men instead of three men and two women, so be it. Um, because that's how you're going to rebalance the world. The world is already so skewed in one direction that it's going to take actions that appear to be skewed the other way for it to be anything like balanced. Women experience life in a different way, and so they often bring a different viewpoint. Even though I believe that the best person for the job should be chosen for the job, I do think that you know there is a disadvantage to women in the industry, so I don't think there's any harm in having extra incentives to bring women into the industry. You euthanized your faithful companion cube more quickly than any test subject on record. It's important for women to be in the industry. It's important for everyone to be in the industry. As many voices as possible um, adds to the sort of richness. I mean, the way you get that is by having diverse voices, whether they be women, men, you know, um, intersex you know, transgender, uh, straight, gay, everything, you know, it, it, we've got to have those diverse voices, um, otherwise we're just going to stagnate. If we're going to actually entertain the world, and if the games we make are reflective of the people making them, then our studio kind of needs to be comprised of the people of the world. And we have a wild spectrum of really awesome people at the studio that affect what goes into our games, and you can feel it. With Tearaway, we were, we were creating an adventure that had you, the player, interacting with, a, with um, Iota or Twa. And within that, I was very proud of the fact that we were really thinking about gender and how we ask people how they want to be represented. When you're making games that have communities, you have to be progressive about how you're thinking about how those people are represented. And there just isn't really any room not to be. Many voices is good. And once they get over the fear, they'll realise that, that the more voices we have access to, the better 
our lives will be, the better our art will be, the better our pastimes will be, the better our friendships will be, the more voices you have access to, the better. Games are going to be telling the stories of the future, like, the, you know, history is going to be like, oh, what games we're doing where? And so not having women's voices there, it's just really restricting whose stories we get to hear, whose perspectives you get to see, you know, like, it's not a gender divide, really. We all play games, we all, humans play, it's what we do. We usually think, oh, men play these kinds of games and women like these kinds of games. And if we let women into the gaming sphere, then it's going to change the kinds of games that we like. That's actually, our researchers actually found that's not the case. What men like and what women like are actually overlap really, really well. If women start developing their own games and playing the games that they want to play, will that change the scene? No, it'll probably just make it friendlier and more open and allow for more diversity. The games that people want will still be there. I have a name. It's Liara Tassoni, and I'd appreciate you using it from now on. It's an amazing industry, you know, like it is a medium of our time. But that real understanding of um, sort of different systems working together in a harmony and the real people that are involved with those and the narrative journeys, those are all things which help us as, as, as humans. And we've all had that from literature and film and theatre and art you know, for a long time. And I think it's really important we embrace that the games industry and games are the modern contemporary way for us to find those experiences together. It's a really exciting time to be a female game developer. Nowadays with Unity 3D and Unreal Engine being affordable and programs like Blender and Modo being right down in the low price point, you can, you can start making game tonight, you can release it next week. There are so few barriers and we're working really hard to just knock down those last barriers to make it something where gamer girls can just go, no, this is a serious career and I want to do it. And if women want to make games, make them. Because you'll find there's other women out there. You might not have any in your immediate circles, but if you search for them, you'll find them and then you won't feel so bad. Like, when there's 60 women behind you, you feel a lot more comfortable. So make stuff, it's amazing, it's fun. City Skylines is a city builder that clearly knows what virtual mayors want. Now, this comes from the Cities in Motion developers, who in previous games have focused more on finessing a city's transport systems. But now they've created a full-blown city sim. You start off with a blank square of land, and from there you draw out some roads, zone a few areas for residential, commercial and industrial buildings, plonk down a few utilities like power plants and water pumps, and then sit back and watch your city grow. Typical city building stuff. As your city grows and you hit certain population milestones, you unlock new buildings and extra services to provide, like education and health. Best of all, with each milestone you reach, you can buy a whole new plot of land. And you're free to buy a plot in any direction, letting you expand your city over the map however you like, with up to nine plots being available. Finally, big cities, Hex! Yeah, it's great to be able to build a giant, sprawling metropolis, especially after the tiny little cities we got in the last SimCity game. Yeah, I like how you can create individual districts and set policies for that area. For example, you can ban heavy trucks from going through your peaceful residential districts, or apply various tax breaks and boosts to your zones. Mm, it just gives you a nice bit of extra control over each area. You can also use districts to specialise your industrial zones, so you can change big polluting factories into peaceful green forestry or farming. I always find city builders to be quite a zen-like experience, like a virtual garden that you're just watching bloom, but City Skylines is especially chilled out. Yeah, I mean, it's pretty easy to keep your budget in the green and there are no real disasters to worry about. Fires do break out, but they don't spread. Crime rates stay strangely low, and you won't get hit by tornadoes or earthquakes or anything like that. I also found it pretty easy to exploit, since you can just get your city turning a decent profit, then walk away for a while and come back to millions of dollars. Yeah, it does feel a bit like cheating. I just like watching how cities cope with disasters, and there's a particular maniacal joy in watching a virtual city burn. <laughs> the best you can do is build a dam and then flood your city with the surprisingly detailed water simulation. It's still kind of fun. Yeah, and that's not to say there isn't any challenge here. As you might expect from a developer that has a penchant for making transport games, the real difficulty here is in managing the traffic. Oh, the traffic. Yes, the mid-to-late game is certainly all about public transport and building efficient roads. 
there's heaps of road types and public transport options to play with, and you need to get to grips with what each one should be used for. Also, it seems like unless you get your traffic sorted, then you basically lose any demand for new zones. So the better you design your city, the better it can get. It's like a civil engineer's dream or nightmare. I'm not sure which one. <laughs> I quite got into it, Hex, and it wasn't long before I was going online and searching tutorials and getting tips on how to build really efficient roads and really get into the public transport side of things. But my first attempts were pretty rubbish. <laughs> yeah, it's actually kind of daunting just how much control they give you. You can build huge, elaborate intersections and you actually have to draw out each bus route and train line individually, which can get a bit messy. I never thought I would get so excited about intersections, but some of the things I've seen people come up with are ingenious. Look at all those filthy trucks merging. Oh yeah. Moving on, one of the best things about this game is the way they've incorporated community-created content. From within the main menu, you can easily search for and add on mods, new buildings, intersections, save games. Anything the community has created is just a few clicks away. And there's already a huge and passionate community supporting it. Yeah, and this is what impressed me the most. The mods. There's a mod for pretty much anything you could want, and even some stuff that you probably don't. Want to unlock all 25 areas for truly massive cities? That's a mod. Want fire to spread? You know that's a mod. First person camera? Flight sim? Tsunami generator? Mod, mod, mod. So many mods. Plus, there is a huge amount of famous buildings that you can add that have been recreated in pretty impressive detail. Get the Sydney Opera House in there if you want, but while you're at it, why not build a shrine to your favourite Elder Scrolls deity? Or even the Citadel from Half-Life 2. How cool is that? It's very cool. And it's great that they put a map and asset editor right in the game, so anyone can just jump in and start creating assets. Yet again, people have made some pretty cool maps already with accurate reconstructions of places like New York and Gabe Newell's face. Someone even recreated Los Santos from GTA 5. Well, we should wrap this up, Barjo. Final thoughts? This is so much fun. It's everything I wanted SimCity to be, and what it doesn't have, people are just adding to it. I'm giving it four stars. Yeah, this is one of the best city builders I've ever played in its own right, and it's made even better by a passionate community. I'm giving it four out of five as well. Castle of Terror from 1984. You play as a brave rescuer who is promised to save the daughter of an old man you meet in a tavern. Exploring the spooky castle where she is being held, you solve a range of puzzles and ultimately face off against her captor, a vampire. And it's our name the game because it was developed by Melbourne House and all those people you just saw were at our Melbourne Comedy Festival show last week. If you managed to come along, then thanks for making it awesome. We loved seeing you there. Yes, it was a fun bit of silliness. Are we ready to play Good Game Live? Yes! <laughs> Oh, oh, oh. Sonic the Hedgehog! Yes! Sonic the Hedgehog! Hey! 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 Big round of applause. <laughs> 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 oh, oh. <laughs> Little Wings. <laughs> Jesus Christ. Like a, <laughs> Yoshi or like a T-Rex? Oh. Or like an angry dinosaur? Angry Bird! Angry yes! Bird! Oh. Oh. Next week, we take up a sword and shield in Pillars of Eternity. This is about my people. If that's not worth blood, I don't know what is. And it's back to the future with some side-scrolling action from Axiom Verge. And over on Spawn Point, our show for younger gamers on ABC3 this weekend, we pump the fun up to 10 with Mario Party 10. <laughs> Until next time, may all your games be good ones. Hex out. Bajo, also out. When you say mare... You're saying it wrong. We argued about mayor this for about a, ten minutes. Mare is a female horse. Mare. Mare. Do you say mare? I say, I say there's a female horse. I don't say mare because I get confused. <laughs> Sing it wrong. <laughs> <laughs>